Coming up on DTNS, Apple and Zoom fulfill Chinese requests over content removal. Snapchat steps up their augmented reality game, and Uber and Lyft lose a battle over calling their drivers contractors in California. But the war ain't over. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 11th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Alameda County, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shank. We were just talking sandwiches, getting haircuts in the time of pandemic, and a whole lot more on Good Day Internet. Get that expanded show by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A screenshot posted by app researcher Jane Manchin Wong shows that Twitter is developing a new feature that would let users react to tweets with emoji beyond just likes or retweets. If this sounds familiar to you, well, the company did try something similar back in 2015. Real quick, I declare Jane Manchin Wong a national treasure. Carry on. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Apple confirmed in its all virtual WWDC 2020 event uh, uh, starting on June 22nd will include a keynote address, platform State of the Union, 100 plus engineering sessions, and all new developer forums, one on one labs with more than 1,000 Apple engineers, and more. The keynote will stream, quote, directly from Apple Park. Adobe released Photoshop Camera in the iOS App Store and on Google Play uh, before you could get it in public preview, but now it's there for everybody. Includes AI-powered features, custom lenses, some tricks like face light that optimizes lighting to remove sharp shadows, uses Sense AI to recognize the subject in a photo, and it can recommend and automatically apply adjustments. Go get it. I, I was hanging out with that earlier. It's a nice app. Uh, it's a bit of a departure, but, you know, that is a story for another time. A year after he quit his position at the company over differences with CEO Mark Zuckerberg over Facebook's direction, Chris Cox is returning to the company as its chief product officer. Facebook says that Cox will resume his duties that include overseeing the core Facebook app, Messenger, Instagram, and WhatsApp, along with marketing. The Internet Archive announced in a blog post that it has ended it's national emergency library programs two weeks earlier than originally scheduled due to an ongoing commercial publisher lawsuit. The Internet Archive will revert to a controlled digital lending, or CDL, model that it's been using for almost a decade prior to March, where only one person can digitally check out a book for each physical copy the library has in stock. The UK postponed a test of the second version of its contact tracing app on the Isle of Wight. Uh, remember, they were supposed to launch this thing June 1st, so it's been delayed. BBC sources say the apps are having difficulty using Bluetooth to estimate distance. In fact, BBC did a really good technical breakdown of all of that. Ministers in the UK are reportedly considering switching to making an app that works with the exposure notification platform developed by Apple and Google. Intel revealed specifications for its first hybrid x86 platform called Lakefield, which pairs one higher power Sunny Cove CPU core with four efficient Tremont Atom cores in a stacked arrangement using Intel's Forveros technology. Lakefield has already been announced for use in the Samsung Galaxy Book S, the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Fold, and the Microsoft Surface Book Neo. The European food delivery company Just Eat Takeaway announced that it has agreed to acquire Grubhub in an all-stock deal worth $7.3 billion. This comes two months after Takeaway acquired Just Eat in an $8 billion merger. Bloomberg reports that Uber had reportedly been in talks with Grubhub about an acquisition prior to the COVID-19 lockdowns, but concerns over U.S. regulatory approval delayed that deal. Just Eat Takeaways hopes to use Grubhub to launch its services in the United States market. Wall Street Journal sources say the European Commission plans to file formal antitrust charges against Amazon, alleging it used data from third-party sellers to compete against those third-party sellers. Charges would take about a year to investigate before the commission decides if they're true. And even if they are true, Amazon could still appeal them in court after that. The eventual fine, if the charges withstand all of that, could be as much as 10% of annual revenue. But it would take years to get to that point. All right, let's talk a little more about what Amazon's doing to try to say we're giving you good news. <laughs> You're right, Tom. Amazon announced that it will not let law enforcement use its recognition facial service for one year in order to give government time to introduce legislation about the ethical uses of facial recognition. 
The U.S. House Committee on Oversight and Reform has held a number of hearings on the use of facial recognition technology, but has yet to introduce a bill. The Washington Post reports that Microsoft President Brad Smith said that Microsoft will not sell its facial recognition technology to police departments until a federal law on facial recognition has passed. Facial recognition is frequently trained on databases that reflect existing bias. So we've we've been you know covering the drumbeat of this uh, from from the exposés of which companies were doing what uh, to IBM saying we're just going to pull out of the business we'll keep supporting existing contracts uh, but we won't sell any more uh, and pushing for legislation and now we're now we're seeing Amazon and Microsoft's approaches Amazon is saying a year moratorium so you can't use it anymore for a year but that's just to give the feds time to put in the legislation and then we'll bring it back. I think that's an attempt to kind of keep law enforcement from signing a new contract with somebody else, uh, which is one of the things I've been saying is, look, if if the big companies pull out, there will be other companies fill in. So you got to take yeah. that into account, uh, but also pushing for legislation and Microsoft uh, taking a, a more of a hammer approach saying, look, we're just not going to sell it until there is legislation. Yeah, I mean, the year long snooze button is an interesting way to put it. There is obviously a sunset on their uh, on their self-imposed restrictions on when they are going to put stuff out. What I would love to see now, though, is for a lot of these major players and and some of the people behind it to say, you know, maybe talk to uh, uh, privacy advocates and come up with what they want to see in this legislation and, and be be forceful with it and, and don't just say, well, the feds have to act, but the feds have to act a certain way. Yeah, and that's something Microsoft has been really good at. They, they've they put out some very detailed uh, papers. Brad Smith particularly has put in some blog posts about what they need to see in that kind of facial recognition. Yeah, I just think unity on this particular situation would be big. But because right now, you know, pardon me if I don't exactly see literally every move that is being made in this very highly charged environment as ex exactly being for pure motives and not just to stay out of the fire. But uh, um, <laughs> I, I would I would like to see Amazon get behind something like that. Yeah, it would be cool to see multiple companies come together on and and work on proposed legislation yeah. as outside advisors. It'd be lovely to see a government that welcomed that. Indeed. Well, Snapchat made quite a few announcements during its annual developer event Thursday, including Lens Voice Search, which will let you ask the app to find filters that do something like change your hair color or take you to the moon, you know, fun Snapchat stuff. Or Snapchat also announced partnerships with PlantSnap and Dog Scanner to identify plants and dogs with the camera inside Snapchat. It's actually very interesting because I have standalone apps that do both of these things. <laughs> if I could do them inside Snapchat, I might actually launch the app more often. Later this year, Yuka will provide nutritional content when you can scan product labels within Snapchat as well. SnapMe lets developers bring their own neural net models to transform the environment in images. For example, Wannabe will bring its foot tracking tech to let users Try on sneakers within a lens. Prisma applies artistic styles to the world. Local Lens is a geography-based uh, specific AR system that will use public snaps to help create 3D maps of the real world. This will enable persistent AR in larger public areas. Obviously, that is something that a lot of companies are interested in doing. A new design for Snapchat also adds an action bar at the bottom uh, to make navigation more clear and change based uh, on what screen that you're on. Snapchat, for instance, will appear to the left of the chat screen, and then the map will introduce places that let you can uh, let you find local businesses, other locations, find out information, order food, for example, and a new discover section replaces shows, adding happening now instead, which is a curated section of shows at the top and a section to highlight originals. Snap also announced that Snap originals from a variety of you know big. Uh, places you've heard of, ESPN, NBC, Viacom, uh, have some shows with viewers in the millions. Tens of millions. I mean, this yeah. is those are numbers Quibi would like to see, uh, and <laughs> I don't think they are. Uh, so, I mean, that the Snap Originals is is interesting, especially in this world of like who could possibly do short form video that will work, and Snap is over there quietly doing it. But this augmented reality stuff really stands out to me as. You know, we, we we sort of poke fun of the fact that Snapchat a few years ago said we're a camera company, but I feel like they really are an augmented reality company. Like the idea that you can just tell Snapchat, hey, make my hair pink and it'll make your hair pink uh, is yeah, kind right, of impressive. Right. 
the idea that you could just use it to augment reality the world around you based on user contributed snaps that that you can uh, point snap uh, eventually at anything and it'll tell you what it is like we're starting with plants and dogs you know but right. but that's just the beginning that's why they want to have the snap ml uh, available for people to add different functionality I, I this is one of the more exciting snapchat announcements that I think we've had in a while yeah I mean I I I bailed out of snapchat. I don't know. I probably haven't opened it in a year. Uh, I mean, it, it, except for like research purposes, but not for fun. Um, and that was because I remember Snapchat as a very different thing, you know, where it's like, oh, you know, you you have like you vomit a rainbow or, you know, like silly stuff. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that was and that was fun, but it kind of ran its course. And then something like the physical snap uh, snap spectacles came out. And, you know, I remember thinking, well, maybe this is the new thing. And I don't know anybody who's wearing those, but I also was like, huh, this company is really thinking outside of the box. The AR part of where these initiatives are going are really interesting. You know, it's not about making your hair pink because it's a cutesy app. It's about being able to do things like that. And that's what I think, you know, it, the, again, the sort of idea of like, yeah, I don't know, look at a plant and be able to identify it. That is a real thing. I do that all the time. That if I could think of Snapchat as a place where I do things, lots of things like that, then then it becomes much more powerful. If, if, if you want to get a sense of uh, how much Snap has done work with AR, then please go ahead and download the Snap camera, which is a, a <laughs> camera for your uh, uh, for like, you can use it on zoom and stuff like that, but it really gives you a sense of how much work they've done and how fun some of the lenses can be. And, uh, do check out the video version at youtube.com slash daily tech news show to see Justin say all that as a pickle. Apple has removed pocket casts from the app store in China saying the cyberspace administration of China determined the podcast app could be used to access illegal content in the country. Apple informed pocket cast of the decision in advance two days before the removal, suggesting that Pocket Cast should contact China if they wanted to find out what content was being considered objectionable. Pocket Cast says it believes podcasting should be free of government censorship and will not take down content at China's request. So even though they don't know which podcast it was, they don't sound that interested in finding out. The Castro podcast app was also pulled from the Chinese app store on June 6th, but podcast one of the biggest ones to have this happen. In a separate but related story, uh, a lot of people are reporting that their Zoom accounts were suspended or meetings were disrupted because of some connection to China, even though the meetings may be held involving people outside of China or even originating outside China. For instance, Xiao Fangxiu, a leader of the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests, who now lives in California, had his accounts suspended after taking part in a commemorative stream. It has now been restored. Zoom says they regret the error. A Hong Kong activist had his account deactivated, uh, and a meeting on June 3rd commemorating Tiananmen Square was deactivated midstream. Zoom says it's complying with local law, but added, quote, we regret that a few recent meetings with participants both inside and outside of China were negatively impacted and important conversations were disrupted. Zoom says it will modify its process to better protect users. So Zoom has moved on from security breaches uh, to censorship controversies as they continue to learn on the job uh, because of their newfound popularity. Man, they are speed running controversies, huh? <laughs> like they are they are in the advanced uh, Dungeons and Dragons portion of how to uh, get in trouble in terms of the public. But look, uh, uh, as we let off with that story, this is something that Apple and Google deal with every day. A, a, a lot of these major companies are constantly dealing with uh, uh, requests or, I mean, you can- Well, I, I'll, I'll correct you real quick. Google doesn't, because Google doesn't operate there. Well, sure, yeah. Not yeah. the Play Store, anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly not, yeah. Uh, 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 but these are things that you have to do uh, mm -hmm. when you play ball in China. You wanna access that market, you play by their rules. I believe that their rules are uh, very bad. And I think we are seeing now uh, how complicated that is on a platform like Zoom that, erases physical barriers and that means getting into extra legal uh, uh, territory when you have conflicting ideologies and governments that enforce them. 
Yeah, and the reason you're seeing Zoom uh, have this controversy when maybe you're not seeing other competing products is a lot of those competing products don't operate in China to begin with for various yeah. reasons. They may have a conscientious objection to it, or they may just not want to have to deal with a different set of rules or, or having to partner with a company on data storage, uh, whereas Zoom is, is trying to to straddle that line in a product that doesn't respect lines because it's on the internet and it wants to interoperate with everyone. Crazy that China would disrupt a Zoom meeting uh, about a thing that didn't happen. That's nuts for them. Well, I see what you're saying because it didn't happen according to some According people. to China. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. The, technolo the, the Technology Coalition uh, was formed in 2006 with the goal of stopping child sexual exploitation and abuse. Its 18 members include Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Twitter. The coalition uh, published the Project Protect, which includes five goals, including investing in new technology, holding annual forums with governments and law enforcement, funding independent research into changing trends with child exploitation, creating new sy uh, systems to better share information and new threats across the industry, and share insights on reporting, including a way for firms to benchmark their progress. The group says it will spend millions on research and publish annual reports on its progress. The companies are trying to show that these issues can be dealt with without resorting to weakening encryption. Yeah, not to undersell the importance of what they're doing, and and I think there's a there's a genuine usable effort here to to combat a rising problem. Uh, we're seeing these platforms like Facebook and Twitter uh, being used more often uh, for exploitation like this. Uh, but one of the reasons that they have a clear motivation to make this work is that the the uh, what about the children argument is used whenever a backdoor for encryption comes up is like we want to catch these horrible people and and the argument is we can do it easier if we can break encryption and the, and the fact is it's arguable whether that's true or not uh, but these companies have to show that there are other ways to catch a predator than just putting a backdoor in encryption if they want to win that argument that is yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, tough subject. All of these companies should be doing what they're doing. I'm, I'm glad that they're working together to, to, to try to be smarter in the future. Well, and, and it is an important encryption conversation as well, because yep. this is, this is the, the, the one thing that you will always politically be able to turn the dial on is protecting kids and specifically in situations where we know that they are being targeted and exploited, uh, but at the same time, you know, the the onus is on these companies to prove that it's not something that they gotta, you know, cut a hole in the back door in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the the security and protection that I think all of their users deserve. Facebook is testing a version of Facebook search that display, uh, displays factual information in the sidebar when searching for certain topics like public figures or movies or TV shows or places of interest, et cetera. The information displays work similar to Google search knowledge panels. So if you, you know, if you know how it works in Google, it's probably kind of look the same, at least Facebook wants it to look the same within Facebook, pulled from publicly available sources, including Wikipedia. This is an outcome of Facebook's transition from graph search with used Facebook user data to keyword search. The test is running for some users of English language Facebook on iOS and also the web. Yeah, the graph search thing uh, really fell out of favor in 2016 after the Cambridge Analytica stuff uh, hit. And people said, well, hold on, you're doing what with our information? You're sharing it how? Uh, and Facebook has really dialed down. They haven't got rid of it, but they've dialed it way back and focused on keywords where it's not using any particular user data. It's just saying, oh, when you search this word, we'll yeah. show you relevant Facebook groups, we'll show you relevant Facebook posts. And now they're doing this, which is like, and if it's something that that we, it's just a generic term, like what is that movie? We'll show you that. Uh, the TechCrunch article on this says that it has variable uh, uh, quality. Uh, some things don't turn up anything at all that you you might think they would. So it may be that it's in its early days. Uh, but when it works, it, it seems to, like you said, Sarah, it works very similar to the Google Knowledge Panel and just shows you an excerpt from something that is, you know, fairly uncontroversial. It's funny to think that Wikipedia, the thing people used <laughs> to throw stones at for like, yeah, I can't trust Wikipedia. It's made by people is, is now seen as a more reliable <laughs> source compared to Facebook. Well, and it's funny because I think of... 
am I ever in Facebook and being like, huh, I don't know that term. Maybe I should mm. look it up within Facebook and see if I can get some contextual info. I would just never do that, but it's never been offered before. That's something that I would bounce out and do within Google or, you know, I don't know. I mean, choose your search engine, but, but it, the, the idea that people would get start getting comfortable within Facebook to do stuff like that would keep them within Facebook. And so it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and I think it also, I'm curious to know what the Facebook, what, what searches they were seeing that, that made them think like, Oh, okay. People are just randomly saying like the war of 1812 and, and, <laughs> you know, um, random stuff, but that the, cause that, that's what this kind of, res, that this kind of, a uh, solution it would be good for is telling you things that aren't just searching for your friends, family, or groups, uh, which is the only thing I've ever used the Facebook search bar for. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget about daily tech headlines. You can go get it at dailytechheadlines.com. Let's catch you up on California AB5 and contractors as full-time employees. For years, ride-hailing services like Uber and Lyft have contended that they are just the technology platform that connects independent drivers with independent people wanting rides. The drivers, in their view, are not employees. California passed a law called AB5 that laid out new rules about how to determine if someone is an independent contractor or an employee. Uber and Lyft contend that even under these new rules, drivers are independent. I'll dig down into California AB5 just briefly for you because it bears on whether you agree with Uber and Lyft or the state of California on this. California Assembly Bill 5 made a California Supreme Court case, which is called Dynamex Operations versus Superior Court, into law. It's interesting because Dynamex was a same-day courier service that in 2004 just suddenly decided all of its employees who were drivers were now contractors. Drivers were paid per delivery. They could refuse deliveries, but only if they acted immediately. They had to notify in advance what days they wished to work so they could, quote, set their own schedule, but only with conditions. And they could only quit with three days' notice. They couldn't just stop taking, uh, taking jobs. Drivers also had to buy a lot of equipment, like uniforms with the logos of Dynamex on them and a Nextel phone to, to keep in touch with dispatchers. So it's a little bit of a different situation that Uber, where you just turn on the app when you want to work and you turn it off when you don't. Now, the court ruled against Dynamex and set the precedent that workers should be presumed employees and the burden of proof to show an employee is in fact an independent contractor is on the employer. That's a really important point to consider here is Uber and Lyft have to prove that their drivers are independent contractors. Otherwise, you assume they're employees under this ruling. California legislature basically took that ruling and made it law in AB5. AB5 went into effect January 1st. So there's a three-part test to prove that an employee is a contractor. One, and you have to meet all three, one, the individual is free from direction and control and under his contract for the performance of service and in fact. So you can't just say he's under contract and then boss him around. The individual has to be free from direction and control. You say, we want you to do this thing. How you get it done, that's your deal. The service has to be performed outside the usual course of business of the employer. That's where Uber and Lyft say, hey, our business is just connecting people. We don't actually drive anyone anywhere. That's They're trying to meet that part of the test. And then the third of the three is the individual is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, profession, or business of the same nature as that involved in the service performed. In other words, the person does this sort of thing for other people. Uh, it's not just for your company. So in Dynamex's case, you can't say like, oh, they're an independent contractor, but their only client is us, and their only client has ever been us. That, that would fail that test. Now, exemptions to AB5 can be granted for certain occupations, and they have been granted for doctors, dentists, psychologists, insurance agents, stockbrokers, lawyers, accountants, engineers, and real estate agents. Uh, and they can be granted if you can show that the price of your service can be negotiated, there's direct communication with the customers, earnings are at least twice that of minimum wage. But again, this is a defense to prove someone is an independent contractor when you can't meet the three-part test. 
California's not the only one with this kind of law. New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Connecticut have similar laws as well. So that's AB5. Uber and Lyft applied for one of those exemptions. They said, look, we we meet all three parts of the test, we think, and uh, we pay people better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Wednesday, as part of a document on rules for transportation networking companies, which is what California considers Uber and Lyft, the California Public Utilities Commission ruled that it considers Uber drivers to be employers. In other words, no exemption for Uber or Lyft uh, and other transportation networking companies. They all have to provide workers' compensation for all employees by July 1st or be in violation of AB5. And if they're found in violation, the state could revoke their operating authority. California's attorney general and the city attorneys of San Diego, San Francisco, and Los Angeles have already sued Uber and Lyft even before this decision over non-compliance, and this decision will help bolster their case. Meanwhile, Uber and Lyft are pushing for a ballot measure, which is on the ballot in California in November, to overturn AB5 at the ballot box and say, no, that shouldn't be the law of the state of California. All right. So, Justin, that's where we are. Yes. Uh, in a word, uh, on AB5, uh, I would say, boo! I think this is a very bad law, and I think that it has overreaching consequences. I think it's overbroad. Uh, if you were relying on the state to give exemptions, then I, I don't believe that that is efficient for people to be able to do their job legally. Although, I, I think th there are two things here. Number one, the perceived or reality fairness of a deal that somebody gets when they work with any of these companies uh, of, of for which you are able to turn on an app, get work, and then uh, turn it off when you're done. Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, all these things, right? Uh, if the workers want to negotiate or strike or communicate or the state wants to facilitate the ability for these emerging gig workforces to interact with the platforms for which give them money, I'm okay with that. But when you're making it illegal to do that kind of work without defining them as employees, which fundamentally changes part of the worker bargain that you get from this, uh, uh, which you, where you are able to define your own schedule, then I think that that is, it, it was a bad idea when we had a great economy. I think it's a increasingly terrible idea now that a lot of people are out of work and need quick money to continue to move on with their lives. I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but this needs a new law. Uh, AB5 is not the law for gig workers. It's a law responding to a company trying to basically break the rules, Dynamex, uh, and it doesn't apply well to Uber and Lyft. The same token, Uber and Lyft drivers need some more protections than a normal independent contractor. This is different than somebody you get to come and put up drywall in your house. Uh, Uber and Lyft are more like employees than your normal independent contractor. And I think state laws would rightly recognize that and say, hey, we, we need to have a system for this new way of doing work that doesn't have the downsides that Justin just said about limiting choice, but also provides a safety net, provides uh, at least a recourse uh, for drivers who, who may not be able to push the companies to to do the things that will help make their lives better and protect their, their rights as workers. And, and so I think that's why we have AB5 is it, the system wasn't working well for the drivers, uh, but they overcorrected and now they've made it uh, so that, you know, Uber and, and Lyft are not wanting to hire people in the state. And also it affects other industries. And I have a conflict of interest talking about this because I hire people, I pay people to come on the show like Justin yeah. uh, and he's not a full-time employee. So where does that put me? Like, how do I make sure that I can do that legitimately without running afoul of this law? There's a lot of unintended consequences going on here. They tried to carve them out with an exemption, but that becomes a, a game of, of chasing your tail. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Unsurprisingly, the story was among many others on our subreddit this morning. You can submit stories that you care about and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Brad Schick, Paul Boyer, and Dustin Campbell. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young. Looks like you're going to get on a plane pretty soon, sir. Yeah, I'm going to head on out to uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, next week uh, as the first 
uh, campaign event since the lockdowns happens uh, in in Tulsa. So I'll be out there doing that. You can hear all about uh, not only my my trips out back to the front lines of our our burgeoning uh, general election, but everything else that's happening in the world of politics at politicspoliticspolitics.com. Hey, folks, uh, you, we got so many good reviews on the Apple podcasting app, uh, and I just want to thank you for that and encourage those folks who are going to get around to it to, to get around to it. It really does help uh, people find the show, even if you don't use the Apple podcast app. A lot of people just go in there to find shows, and they may subscribe to them in a different app. Uh, so please, uh, if, if you think about it and you want to do it, uh, pop into that app and uh, just leave the stars. You don't even have to write anything. Uh, leave the stars uh, to help people discover Daily Tech News Show in the Apple Podcast app. And thanks to everybody who continues to support us at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Write us early and often. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>